Good, great, good, 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 good. Sorry, every time I get up here, I will, you know, I shuffle the pulpit because I'm so short and I can't see over the pulpit. So if I move the pulpit, I can see your beautiful faces. There's logic to this, I promise. Um, Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out today. Not even coming out today. This is what we do. We meet together as a community of believers every week. It's a commandment. We don't forsake it. It's beautiful, glorious, and there's caffeine. Well, what do you want? Um, (laughs) First of all, again, I want to thank uh, Pastor Kyle, uh, my husband, for giving me the opportunities to speak. I remember the first time I spoke, I said these words. Um, I said, I'm grateful that I have a husband who doesn't believe that I just have something to sing, but I have something to say. And I'm always very grateful for these opportunities uh, to do so. Um, Maybe he's just sick of hearing my opinions at home. He's like, give the woman a pulpit. (laughs) I would too. Um, (laughs) But anyways, everybody, family, shut your eyes. We're going to pray. We're going to pray, Father. Oh, your presence is already in this place. I can feel it. You're already moving and working on the hearts of men and women and children in this room. Father, I thank you for your word that when Jesus, you left, you sent the Holy Spirit, but you also have the, gave us the word of God that was there from the beginning of time that we may not be lost, abandoned children but that we are constantly aided by your words and your ways that give us life and life everlasting. So I thank you, Lord, as we open up your word this morning, that we see your words come to life in our lives and we grow ever nearer and ever deeper in love with you, just as we know you more, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, the title of my message this morning is Takes Long. If you were here last week for Kyle's message, you'll know the reason why, but I will explain the reason as to why this message is called Takes Long. I'll fill you in soon, but let's get straight into it. Who here has their Bibles? Oh, that's beautiful. I actually, I whipped out my old, old, old Bible that I absolutely loved as a teenager. It's a good old faithful ESV. Flick open to Exodus 6. We're going to spend most of our morning uh, in this uh, little passage here. Exodus 6. How about you say a here when you're here? Here? Oh, good. Okay. I will continue. (laughs) So a bit of context as we read from where we're starting off today, there's a bit of context to this story. If you start reading from chapter 6 verse 1, you'll be like, what's going on? So Moses has had his burning bush experience and God has told him, Moses, it's your job. I'm calling you. My people have suffered enough. They're coming out of Egypt. And we've been through that. So as we start to read, we see and we pick up that Moses has approached Pharaoh with his brother Aaron and has requested that the people of Israel be let go into the wilderness for three days to celebrate a feast unto the Lord. Just a three-day a three-day event. They would be back and they would be back as slaves in three days. That was, that was the original plan. Pharaoh of Egypt, the most powerful man, the most powerful. No one was greater than the Pharaoh of Egypt in this time in history. Doesn't seem like too much of an ask. Perhaps it was because Pharaoh said, no deal. It's not happening. I'm not letting them go. I have lots of buildings to be made. I have a beautiful statue of my face to be made. I'm not letting go of the Hebrew slaves. And Pharaoh was so aggravated that Moses had requested this of him that not only did he just say no, he said, I'll even make the burdens of the Israelites even greater. And so we know the story that the Egyptian task masters were to provide straw so that the Hebrews could make bricks, which would make the buildings and structures and whatnot. But now the Hebrews had to go collect their own straw and still have the quota of bricks to be made. It's remained the same. And the punishment of not fulfilling these quotas were severe beatings and even death. And the children of Israel were so mad at Moses and Aaron. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you have been? It's almost like when someone, uh, you know, if you're in a classroom, I can't think of an adult context of this, but if someone in your classroom was talking or misbehaving and the teacher says, oh, everyone gets to stay back five minutes during lunch break, that's sort of this context, except the punishment was death. 
So if Aaron and Moses hadn't asked Pharaoh anything, the Israelites would have been to a degree more at peace. So let's read Exodus, just a couple of verses before Exodus 6. Exodus 5, 22, 23. It's on the screen if you aren't reading along with me. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. And you have not delivered your people at all. Exodus 6, 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses, verse 2, and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Verse 4, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. I've remembered my covenant. But back in verse 22, this is what's happening. I'm going to tell you just really flat out, Moses is complaining. He's having a bit of a whinge. He's having a bit of a tantrum to the Lord. But it also says in verse 6, 1, but the Lord said to Moses, but then again in verse 2, it says, God spoke to Moses. We already know they're having a conversation. So what's the reason for two times being mentioned that God is speaking to Moses? Whenever the Bible does this, pay really close attention. There's some amazing things in here why things are repeated in the scripture. So the first time he says, and God spoke to Moses, he's responding to Moses, having a bit of a complaint after Pharaoh rejected Moses' request. And you can hear God, he's like, oh, he said no to you? Oh, oh no, there's trouble. Pharaoh will get to him what I have coming to him. But then it's like he circles back where it says, and God spoke to Moses again. He circles back for the second time. And it's like, wait a minute, okay. Forget about what I'm going to do to Pharaoh in a minute. Moses, you're complaining. Moses, where's your heart at? The next sentence starts with, I am the Lord. In your complaining, just remember who I am. Just remember who I am. And then he goes on to say, and he says, and I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Why is he mentioning the forefathers of Moses right here in this passage? And he goes on to say that not even they knew his real name, but we know that he appeared to them as the I am. I will be what I will be. Hashem, the name. I think it's, I think it's such a beautiful way to say the name of the Lord, the name. Can't get any bigger than that. And then God says, and yet I established my covenant with them. But Moses, you know my name, I am, that's how I appeared to you at the burning bush. Not only did I tell you my name, I told you what my name meant. I showed you miracles at the burning bush. I showed you what I'm going to do. And yet you still don't believe me. You still don't believe me, even though your forefathers didn't even know my real name. And yet they believed in me and I made a covenant with them. The rabbis have a really funny way of, of saying this, and I will paraphrase to put it in a bit more of a modern context. Moses, back in my day, this is the Lord speaking, your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, didn't need to know anything more than my name to believe in me. They didn't need anything more. They never complained about my ways. When I told them to do something, they did it because they believed in the covenant that I made with them. And even though none of them saw the land of Canaan delivered into their hands, they each died with full belief that I will make good on my covenant. In other words, Moses, why can't you be more like your fathers? My mother is here this morning. I'm, I'm sure that my siblings uh, get that. Uh, Isabella, Samuel, Bradley, why can't you be more like your sister Natasha? <laughs> just nod, mum. Just agree with me here. <laughs> so here God is saying, wow, okay, Moses. So before I deal with Pharaoh, 
Pharaoh will get what's coming to him. He said, he will drive you out with a mighty hand. He'll drive you out. But before I even deal with Pharaoh, I need to deal with you. I need to deal with your heart right now because where your heart is, it's not even ready to receive what I'm about to do. If your heart and your faith aren't right with me, says the Lord, we've got a problem. I can't even start working in your life unless we talk about this. So back to the title of my message, Takes Long. This is really a quote from our youngest son, Raphael. He's three. There is a slide up there, Andrew, of our beautiful Rafi. That's it. So um, Kyle mentioned this briefly last week. Whenever we put this young man to bed, he, um, I don't know what the expression is, but he goes like this, oh, takes long. And it's really cute, super cute. Like, takes long for what? He's like, oh, to wake up. He doesn't want to go to sleep because it takes long to wake up. And one night I, I was in the study and I heard his door open because it usually does about six to 70 times a night. And he's, he's walked out of his room and he's plopped himself on the couch and the TV had still been playing. And he just sat there watching the TV and I just walk out, Raphael, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, it takes long. Just so cutely. And you're like, how do you, how do you put that kid back to bed? It's... He's very sweet. He's very sweet. But there's a purpose to this. I promise this is going somewhere. Back in Exodus, what we're just reading, Moses is having a complaint. And you know what? He's pretty much saying what our Raphael says. Takes long. Takes long, God. It takes long. It takes long. When each one of us look at our present circumstances, do we too say, it takes long? Yeah, yeah, we do. But I want to share three things from the lessons that Moses had to learn along the way in the taking long, in the taking long. Because you and I are in the taking long right now. We are. We're right in the thick of it. You can just look outside. You can just read the news. We're in the taking long. Jesus, where are you? This is taking long. Number one, you are not alone. You're not alone. Moses gets a lot of credit and rightfully so. Moses is awesome. But he didn't do this by himself. He had Aaron appointed as his prophet and his sister Miriam also appointed as his prophet. When we were traveling to Mozambique in, uh, I think, 2013, who's been to Johannesburg Airport? Anyone? Yeah, okay, a few people. There used to be a massive billboard, huge, like as big as this whole space. And it was hanging over the boarding gates. And, you know, when you're in Africa, tourism organizations and whatever, they did their advertising really good, 10 stars. And um, the the billboard said, um, African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Who's heard that? Very common, very common. I agree with that uh, proverb, and I would even take it a bit further and say, if you want to go fast alone, you'll be alone fast. (laughs) Simple math. (laughs) But you don't want to be alone. You're not made to be alone. You're made for community, and you're made for family. Even Jesus in Luke 10 verse 1 sends his disciples out in two. Not, they're never by themselves. They're always with someone. If you go alone, you'll get your own way. You won't have any arguments with anybody. You can do your own thing. You can have things done the perfect way that you want to. No one will get in your way. But there's no discipleship in isolation. There's no growth in isolation. There's no challenging you in isolation. But you know what? Being in community is really tough. It's really tough. Who here has family? Yeah, yeah. Being family is tough. Being in community is tough. Even Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. The very people who were so specifically called, called to assist Moses in the promise of God and fulfilling the promise, literally called. I have never had that that experience before in my life where God appears to me and says, 
Natasha, I have called you to be this person's prophet. Never. I've never had that before. These people were specifically called by God to help Moses. And yet they still spoke against him. What did Moses do? Did he cut them off? Did he block them on social media? Didn't want to get an Instagram request from prophet underscore Aaron underscore high priest? (laughs) Or did he tweet about it? He's like, at Miriam prophet water goddess, I am not speaking to her. No, he did not. You know what he did? He forgives. He forgives. You repent and move on. That's what you do in a community. Someone, you know, ticks you off a little bit. Say, you know what, just I love you. Let's pick each other up. We're just, we're going for the promise of God. Let's go together. Come on, let's just, I'm I'm imperfect. I was actually about to say I'm perfect and you're not perfect. (laughs) My husband hears that. No. (laughs) But this is what community is like. Even though Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses, they, they were still called. God didn't revoke the call on their life. No, you just pick each other up and you move on. It just means you're human. It just means we need to repent to one another. You just pick up each other and say, let's keep moving. The promise of God is ahead. Let's go. So you are not alone. And you shouldn't be alone. In the taking long, God gives you companions and friends and family and workers of the promise to be in your life. And we need to learn how to be in community with one another. Because you know what? They're workers of the promise just like you. Number two, you have authority. We know that Moses had a staff and that the Lord said that he will perform signs with it. We also know that this staff, great miracles and wonders were absolutely performed. I won't get into the whole whose staff was it. Was it Aaron's staff? Was it Moses' staff? Were there two different staffs? Well, there's the same staff. Did they rotate, have a roster, share staffs and perform miracles? You can ask Pastor Greg after the service. He will know all the answers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dad. In Exodus 7... <laughs> Uh, It's just on the page next to you if you can still go. You don't have to jump there, but it is right there as we're in Exodus 6. But in Exodus 7, verse 12, when Pharaoh calls for a miracle to be performed, Aaron throws down his staff and it becomes a snake. So Pharaoh calls for his own sorcerers and magicians and they too throw down their staffs and it becomes snakes. In verse 12, for each man cast down his staff and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Let's make something very clear. Moses' staff is not a magic staff. It's not Harry Potter's magic wand. It's not a piece of enchanted wood. There's no magic or power in the staff. It's the authority of God. There's no power in items. Probably a sermon for another day. There's never power in items. It's God. It's the authority of God. The Midrash uh, Rabbah says about this, about why the staff ate the staff and not the snake ate the snake. Because that's interesting that the staffs turn into snakes, but then it doesn't say, and then the snake ate the other staffs. It says the staff ate the staff. Aaron's staff ate their staffs. The Midrash Abbas says, if Aaron's serpent will swallow up the serpents of the Egyptians, there will be nothing remarkable in that. For serpents usually swallow each other. Not surprising. Therefore, let it resume its original form and swallow up their serpents. I want to paraphrase the famous uh, Lubavitcher rabbi. The ways of God are the ways of pleasantness and all its paths are peace. And he's quoting Proverbs 3.17. Our task is to create light, not to battle darkness. Nevertheless, there are times when we are forced to resort to battle when we must vanquish those who seek to vanquish us. Thus, Moses, the gentle shepherd of Israel, and Aaron, the ultimate man of peace, find themselves in the role of judge and chastiser of Pharaoh, crushing the might of Egypt and obliterating its icons and myths. Therein lies the lesson to be derived from the fact that Aaron's rod swallowed the serpents of the Egyptians after it had reverted back to its original form rather than as a serpent itself. Have you ever heard the expression, it's a dog-eat-dog world? What about there's always a bigger fish? Ever heard that one? I first learnt that one from Star Wars as a child. 
Who's ever heard survival of the fittest? Only the strong survive, yeah? When the world plays dirty, you don't play dirty back. Your authority is not the same as worldly authority. It's a spiritual authority. It's from God. For even when you wage war, you are not a warrior. Even when you consume the serpents of the enemy, you are not a serpent yourself spewing the same poison and hate. That isn't the world. This is the, that's the world. This isn't the world for you. You don't play dirty like the world. You have a different authority. When something arches itself back at like a bigger fish, the authority of God is not just a, a bigger fish. That's it. That's the final word. There's no more on it. Survival of the fittest is not about survival of the fittest or evolutionary biology or mutations or, you know, it's only the fittest that survive and, you know, we're just strong because we have to know what God says is final. There's no other bigger fish. There's no other bigger dog. Your present circumstances, you have the authority to command where you are right now. You need to know that in the taking long, you have this authority. You have the same authority. God has prepared you for the taking long. He's prepared you for the taking long. Number three, you have hope. I know that's a bit cliche, and I'm not a fan of cliche, but I couldn't shake this point. I couldn't shake this point. You have hope. During the time of Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees would question Jesus about his interpretation of the Torah. We know this because Jesus was a rabbi, and that's what rabbis did. If, you know, the, the running joke is all, all pastors do is sit around and have coffee with people. The running joke of that day was all rabbis do is to sit down and debate stuff about the Torah, and it's true. But they questioned Jesus on his interpretation because they wanted to know their own beliefs to be verified. And so this is where you see just this constant toing and froing of Pharisees and Sadducees approaching Jesus. And these questions aren't just questions. Um, they can seem a little um, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, what's, what's the point of this? There's no, there's no reason to ask these questions. That they're, they're just being annoying. They just want to trip Jesus up. No, they're asking very specific questions about really big topics in the Torah. We know that the Pharisees and Sadducees disagreed on a huge number of topics. But most importantly, they debated about the condition of the undying soul, the eternity of the soul, and they debated about the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees believed in an undying soul and the resurrection of the dead. And the Sadducees argued against this. Well, once you die, you die. Because they couldn't see evidence of it in the Torah. But Rabbi Simle, a third century scholar, found evidence of the undying soul and the resurrection of the dead in the passage that we just read previously. You can look back with me. Exodus 6 verse 4. It's right there. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. The text says, give them, a, referring to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. And the land of Canaan is all in present tense. It's present tense. And it's always in present tense throughout the Torah. But we know when we read this, they're all dead. They're all dead. So why why is it in present tense? The rabbi reasons that this passage, amongst many others, proves that God will one day resurrect Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the dead in order to fulfill the promise he made to them. Even Jesus, the greatest rabbi, the, <laughs> the goat, the greatest of all time, all you older people, there's, there's a free one for us to try and be hip with the younger people. Goat, greatest of all time, believes in this. Mark 12, 26, 27, you may write this down for further reference. 26, and as for the dead being raised, this is Jesus talking to the Sadducees. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. 
Paul in Philippians 3, 20 to 21, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. Again, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. This is, this is amazing. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Oh, goosebumps. As we look not to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, meaning they come and they go. But the things that are unseen are eternal. God cannot be. We could not sing that song that we did this morning. God cannot be a covenant-keeping God if he promised the land to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, all of whom never claimed the land while they were living, which has to mean that one day when Jesus returns, the dead will be resurrected. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will receive the inheritance of the land of Israel, where it is, and more, and plus some, which is their covenant, their inheritance with God, and sure Surely, surely, God will do the same for you. Your present circumstances, gone. Surely he will do the same for you. But it's only in Jesus, faith in Jesus, that we have life everlasting at the resurrection. He didn't lie to Moses. He didn't lie to the children of Israel. He doesn't lie to you. He's the covenant-keeping God. That's the definition of his name. When we were just talking about how he revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as I am, as I will be what I will be, he revealed the meaning of his name to Moses, which means I am faithful to keep my word. I'm faithful. You can trust in me. In the taking long, you will have hope. You will see your present circumstances fade away. There will be nothing more. Whether you see it in this life or the next, the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was that great that they know even where they are today, they're going to receive that inheritance. They're going to receive the fulfillment of that covenant. If I can have the worship team up, please. Thank you. Back in Exodus 6, from verse 6, After the Lord responds to Moses by referring to his forefather, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he says this, the Lord speaking, verse six, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery from them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. But do you know how the children of Israel responded? You can just keep reading it. You know what they responded back? They said, it takes long. It takes long. It takes long to wake up. It takes long for your promise to come. It takes long for the light at the end of the tunnel. It takes long. But did you know that in the taking long, you're being perfected? You're being perfected. Did you know that in the taking long, it produces in you endurance and patience and steadfastness and kindness and mercy and strength? I want to encourage you with these scriptures. Romans 5, 3 to 5. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. James 1, 2, 4, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Hear this, hear this, hear this. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The taking long, it perfects you. 
and it completes you. In the taking long, you're learning how to live in a community with people who you have nothing in common with except for Jesus. You're learning how to love and forgive and to prioritize the call and the purposes of God. In the taking long, you're learning the authority and the power that Jesus has given to you. In the taking long, your faith is being built to look forward even more so to His return. It takes long. It takes long. But I want to end by speaking to those who in the same place that Moses and the children of Israel were in, in the taking long. This morning, I actually really felt all, and not this morning, all week, I felt in this room there were people suffering with past experiences of rejection. And so you clam up and you don't actually like being in community. You don't actually like people around you. And I believe the Lord is here in this place working already all this morning to heal you, to heal your heart and to bring some forgiveness strongly felt that. In particular, there's two people who are really struggling with that this morning. Secondly, there's always an opportunity for you to know Jesus if you don't already, if you don't know Him. And thirdly, I just felt there were just some people in this place who just need to say, you know, in my taking long, I need to rise up and be thankful for the taking long producing these things in me. Just a word of encouragement. You know, we're at the beginning of the year and I just felt to bring a word that encourages you this morning. So if you are in any category of those three people that I mentioned, if you are dealing with rejection, and I mean, I felt like it cripples you to be around people because you fear rejection, felt that strongly. Second, if you want to know the Lord Jesus and you haven't decided that already. And thirdly, perhaps even from Kyle's message last week, just need a bit of an attitude adjustment to be thankful for what's coming and prayer to just boost you along the way. If that's you, I'm going to be at the front. I'm going to pray for you as a team worships. If same, same God, okay, Pastor Kyle. We'll just be in worship and allow the Lord to minister to us this morning. Thank you.